Honest, responsible, loyal, Jiminy Cricket is probably the best conscience a puppet could ever have. His realistic and subtle movements reinforce the cricket's integrity. But what master of animation was behind such a true-hearted insect? Let's find out. Ward Kimball was born on March 4th, 1914 in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He was a prankster and a joker, always looking for the next laugh. He was also extremely passionate about art and aspired to be an illustrator in New York. In 1932, against his parents' wishes, he accepted a one-year scholarship to Santa Barbara School of the Arts. Go Gauchos! Once the year was over, Ward couldn't afford to continue his education. Instead, he moved back in with his parents, and while working part-time at a theater or grocery store, took any job that came up that involved art. Painting mailboxes, designing high school mascots, Go! A variety of mascots! Or painting murals. His parents, however, were not very happy with their deadbeat son, and soon Ward felt the pressure to get a steady, full-time job. And lucky for him, he was looking for a job during the glorious 1930s! Oh. Oh dear. Work during the Depression was sparse. However, an art school classmate gave him a tip. A small animation studio, Disney, was hiring, and they paid good money. Ward decided to apply, thinking it would be a good stepping stone to launch his art career in New York. The first hurdle, however, would be getting to the studio. Even though money was tight, his mother agreed to drive him to the Disney studio, roughly 200 miles there and back, but she still let him know that this was a one-time opportunity. With family finances in near ruins, there was no possibility of a second trip. His mother stopped at the street entrance to the Disney studio on Hyperion Avenue and put the car in park. Once inside, Kimball approached Mary Flanagan, the receptionist. Quote, I'm applying for a job, he said, and I've brought my samples. As many of the artists had come from personal referrals or other studios, Flanagan appeared confused. She glanced at the folder, not quite sure what to do with it, but promised that someone would get back to him after the weekend. At this, Ward crumpled a little, fearing failure and not wanting to explain to his mother that the trip had been a waste. Quote, it would be nice, he said if you could look at them today because I can't make another trip. He leaned forward, a sad smile wilting onto his face. I don't have enough gasoline, he said. After hearing this, Flanagan sent Kimball's work over to the story department where Walt looked at it. The thing that caught his eye, Kimball later explained, was a sketch I had done for the Edgar Allan Poe story, King Pest, which Ward had created as though he were illustrating it for a magazine. Walt indicated to those around him that he liked it and that Ward should return for work on Monday. Ward was an in-betweener, the lowest level of animator who drew the pictures in between key frames. This menial and thankless job didn't suit Kimball's creative energy. Eventually, Ward became so good at in-betweening that he began to feel comfortable enough to lean into his prankster tendencies. A few times, he would start a chant throughout all the in-betweener desk, singing Volga Boatman while they slaved away. He also made a cartoon of their boss wiggling his ears, which got shown to a handful of animators, much to his boss's embarrassment. All of this caught the attention of Ham Lusk, an animator who mostly worked on silly symphonies. He recognized Ward's talent and took him under his wing, making him an apprentice and teaching him the ins and outs of animation. A few months later, he became a junior animator, and when Snow White rolled around, along with animating bits and pieces of the film, he was given a full dwarf sequence by Walt himself. his work on this scene, a mere four and a half minutes, took 240 days. He worked and reworked individual drawings, looking for ways to convey a character's interior thoughts moment by moment through a simple set of lines. His weekly pay was $40, hardly enough to compensate him for his efforts, but the feature held out the promise of a sizable bonus for footage included in the film. However, after years of work into Kimball's great disappointment, his labor of love would not make it into the picture. 
At the time, Kimball was so disappointed that he considered quitting. Author Todd James Pierce theorizes that after a while of mulling the situation over, he probably went to Walt's office to quit. Quote, even before I got to the point where I said, I don't think I should be working here, Walt took right off on me with a positive approach. He perhaps sensed that I felt lousy and why I had come to his office, and he started waxing enthusiastically about Pinocchio. To make up for the cut scene, Walt promised Kimball a promotion. <laughs> the chance to be a supervising animator on a major character in the next movie, which ended up being Pinocchio. Kimball was given Jiminy Cricket. His first task was to design the character. I took my first um, view of a cricket under, out of a picture book and under a microscope. I was horrified. I said, this is a cricket? This has to carry the picture? all one colored with all these spikes and hairy things sticking out of all, all these appendages. And I said, well, let's see. We could do what we do on a lot of characters. We can humanize them. And so I tried a cricket. If you trained him to stand up, for instance, he would look like this. My one, two, three, four, arms and elbows, two legs. He still was repulsive. And then I decided to look at the old grasshopper and the ant picture that we had done a few years before. And I noticed that they stuck pretty close to a caricature of a grasshopper. They had the spikes on the legs. And they had this long appendage that comes down the back end of his body. and. Of course, his, his feathers were, turned out to be cocktail, but that was a, a, a character you could live with. So I took the grasshopper as, as sort of a foundation, and I made my first drawing of the cricket. Um, he, he wasn't as tall, but he still had those funny legs that attached to the body and had the little pile of tires for a stomach and uh, the sawtooth legs, and we added the uh, uh, umbrella. And bear in mind, every time I would draw a version where I'd show it to the other animators, they said, well, I think it needs more of this. Oh, I think it needs more of this. I'd never gone through that before. And they said, well, Walt likes this, or Walt likes that. And so I, I decided, well, let's, let's eliminate the saw teeth legs, and let's make him a little shorter, and, and, and don't try to get that funny nose that the grasshopper has. And that's when I decided that from these, I will make him to look much the way he looked in the picture at that stage of the character development. Arise, Sir Jiminy Cricket. Where? But you know, he's a cricket because we call him a cricket. Mm. Say, that's pretty swell. Gee. So I started with a real cricket and ended up with what we call Jiminy Cricket. Now, what I'm going to flip for you are what we call the key drawings. They're not all in here, but they're the animator's extremes. And we start with the word you. You don't know right from wrong. Give a little whistle, and he whistles in the hat. And then he opens the hat up, give a little whistle, and then opens it up and you're... When you meet temptation and the urge is very strong, give a little whistle, give a little whistle. What finally emerged is what Kimball dubbed a blob. A very handsome blob, but a blob nonetheless. Saying, it's not a cricket, it is a blob. It is a little man creature with no ears, and he wears a little English outfit, and the only reminiscence of a cricket's wings are the tails of his coat. He added, the audience accepts him as a cricket because the other characters say he is. Although Walt loved Kimball's redesign of the character, Kimball was never fully satisfied and ended up disliking the finished product years later. He said, and I still hate him. Jiminy was said to resemble Kimball in both appearance and mannerisms. He animated the bulk of Jiminy Cricket's scenes, including his speech to Pinocchio in the Pleasure Island Pool Hall. Look at yourself. Smoke. Playing pool. <laughs> You were coming right home with me this minute. Hey, who's the beetle? Hang on, put me down. I'll get out of here. Come here. He's my conscience. He tells me what's right and wrong. What? Kimball's creation remains one of Disney's most popular and recognized characters. 
The next film he would tackle was Dumbo. I'm Dumbo. I designed the, the little locomotive that pulled the circus train called Casey Jr. First time I heard about the story, Walt stopped me in the parking lot and he said, Ward, uh, our, I want to get, get you started on our next picture. It's a circus picture. It's called Dumbo. It's about a, a little baby elephant that's born with big ears and everybody ridicules him. He went through the whole story in about five minutes and he said, I'd like you to do the, the dance sequence where the, the crows teach Dumbo how to fly. Ward Kimball animated primarily the crows who make fun of Dumbo and then really become his mentors on how to fly. Use the magic feather, catch him. And it is marvelous kinetic animation. Very, very exhilarating to watch. Very loose, kind of great choreography. As they did with many of the uh, films, they used live action as a reference. For Snow White, they had March Champion going through motions, and then they would use that as a model. For the Crow sequence in Dumbo, they used a song and dance team, the Jackson Brothers, who, like the Nicholas Brothers, had performed in movies. They came from vaudeville, and they came up with a lot of routines that then Ward Kimball went and plussed in the animation. Maybe the Jacksons had something where they linked arms that they went you know, back and forth in the same sort of syncopation, but Ward Kimball would make it so it looked like the two crows were one crow, and they were working on maybe three legs or something like that. He would just push it a little bit further in the animation. Oh, look at here, look at here. My, my. The crows come in for a certain amount of controversy these days, but all the horseplay between the crows, which Ward animates so well, all that back chat and back and forth that they do. Uh, what's cooking around here? What's the good news? What's frying, boy? That is absolutely accurate to the kind of back chat you would hear from the band on a Cab Calloway record or on a Louis Armstrong record. It's the kind of thing where that kind of back and forth dialogue was totally faithful to that spirit. And I feel like the portrayal of those characters is faithful to that exuberance as well. They are, I would say, the most important characters next to the two leads in the film. They're like surrogate fathers, as Timothy Mouse is to Dumbo. They're the ones who are the most intelligent, the happiest, the freest spirited characters in the whole film, and the warmest. They're the ones who give Dumbo hope. You boys is okay. As an alienated group themselves, they sympathize with his plight, being ostracized because of his physical being. They made him a clown. So it's kind of a brilliant juxtaposition there. Ward would go on to be a particularly important animator throughout Disney's history. He animated the title song in Three Caballeros, Lucifer in Cinderella, and the Mad Hatter, March Hare, Tweedledee, and Dumb, and the Cheshire Cat in Alice in Wonderland. In 1953, he moved into television, where he worked on shorts such as Melody, Toot, Whistle, Plunk, and Boom, and It's Tough to Be a Bird. I got a sell here from It's Tough to Be a Bird. Tough to Be a Bird started out uh, to be um, uh, uh, just a television show. We used um, uh, Richard Bacalian, who had never done any voice recording before in his life. He is an actor. I happened to pass him on the Disney studio lot one noon, and I heard him talking to a guy. I said, he sounded like a New York taxi cab driver. I said, hey, that's our narrator. So I ran back and grabbed him and said, how would you like to do the recording for an animated film I'm working on? He said, well, yeah, 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 sure, why not? And, so uh, that's how we got the voice. It really made the character. It gave him a distinction from anything we'd ever done before. Like so many legendary animators, there is so much more to talk about than can fit in one episode. Ward Kimball is probably the most exciting animator at Disney with his personality, which is often a stark contrast to the other animators that would eventually clash with Walt. Stay tuned for much more on Kimball's bold and exciting life. Or don't. I mean, it isn't me who'll be disappointed, but I mean, I mean a little bit. But it'll be on your conscience.
Ward Kimball was born on March 4, 1914 in Minneapolis, Minnesota. His father was a salesman who traveled all around the country, making Ward attend many different schools. His love of art started in childhood. Really flower till I was in the fifth grade in Glendale, and they used to give a big Hershey bar. Remember those big ones, oh, thick sure. ones, all the nuts in it? Yeah, and the they bit? had nuts in back then, too. Yes, every half inch, Yep. not just three to the bar. I know. And they would give a, she would give a big Hershey bar for the best drawing, and I never won. But one week I did. I drew a picture of an ocean liner. The other drawings were so lousy that I won. And from that point on, I became an artist. Ward went to the Santa Barbara School of the Arts in order to become a painter and illustrator. However, because of the Depression, you know, the great one, Ward was not able to travel to New York as he would like. Instead, Kimball's instructor at the school suggested that his work should be submitted to Walt Disney Productions and that he should pursue a career in animation. In March 1934, Ward Kimball applied for a job at the Disney Studio, and the following April he was hired as an in-betweener. Well, I guess it's good that the Great Depression worked out for somebody. Ward's early work at Disney can be found in our previous episode, which you can find right here. So for this episode, we'll start in the late 40s with his work on Cinderella. World War II was over. Hooray! And Disney Studio was trying to find a new direction to save the studio from financial ruin? Not hooray! Cinderella became their answer, a return to feature-length movies and beautiful animation. Ward got the pleasure of animating Lucifer the Cat and the Mice, Jacques and Gus. Ward Kimball probably had the most fun of anybody on Cinderella. He got the cat, Lucifer. That was perfect casting because you could have never cast Ward Kimball on Cinderella. He would have fallen apart. He would not, not have enjoyed himself. <laughs> I didn't have to work making those very careful drawings of Cinderella and some of the other animators had to work on. And it was pure comedy. The old cat-mouse relationship. And my problem was to develop a cat that looked mean. He had some funny stories about uh, looking for a cat to be a, a personality like Lucifer, because they had mean cats and they had slinky cats and they had all different kind of cats drawn in the story sketches. Walt came out to the house here one day and uh, our six-toed cat we call Feetsy was rubbing up against Walt's leg. And uh, he said, for gosh sakes, Kimball, there's your cat. What are you worried about? And that's what led to my conception of the cat. At the time, he and I were playing in our Dixieland band, the Firehouse 5 Plus 2, and uh, they'd always introduce Ward as the one who had done the mice in the Cinderella, and everyone would go, oh! Then St. Frank there did the stepmother. Uh. <laughs> I said, we gotta get another picture here, Ward. I can't take any more of this. And now it's time for a break in the action to present a discography fun fact. Did you know that Ward loved trains? As a boy, trains captivated him. So when a real train went on sale, Ward took his chance. Well, I heard that one of the railroads was selling one of its uh, second-hand passenger coaches, which was 40 feet long, for 50 bucks. And uh, so I bought it. You see, I can't resist a bargain. Wouldn't it be cheaper to just uh, go on the train and go to Chicago and then have all this stuff in the backyard? Well, um... How much money have you got tied up in this uh, folly out there in the backyard, huh? Well, I paid $400 for the big locomotive. That's 40 feet long, and I paid... You a... know what? You can go to Chicago and the Santa Fe for about $70. <laughs> As he grew older, he continued collecting different full-sized engines and coaches. Sugar cane cars in Hawaii. 
And you found it there? Right after the war, they decided to use trucks. Mm -hmm. And this is, we had two of them here at one time, but we have one left and we steam this up. It's a wood burner, very easy. I can get steam in this thing in about 45 minutes, mm -hmm. take off. The big one back in the shed takes an hour and a half mm -hmm. and it burns coal. But now when you found this locomotive, it wasn't as pretty as it is now, huh? Oh no, it was a rusty piece of junk. We had to put new tubes in the boiler and I had to find a headlight. We had a photograph to go by from the Baldwin Locomotive Works. I had to find a bell, you know, and yeah, to, in order yeah, to restore yeah. it. We had to build this pilot from the blueprints. But at least you had a point of reference right, that right. so that what we see now is exactly as Baldwin turned it out in Philadelphia when they built it. Yes, it's a type they turned out. Uh, a light, a small wheel, mostly made for plantation. Mm -hmm. Does the number one mean anything here? That's our road number. Okay. <laughs> it's not the first locomotive in the world. This is number one. Uh, the big locomotive is number two. Probably if you got another one, it would be number three. We had a three, and that went to the Smithsonian. Oh, <laughs> to the Smithsonian? Yes. Was it that distinctive? A, a, a friend of mine, Jerry Best, had it, and he stored it here, and it was a plantation locomotive, and he's getting along in years, so they asked him, would he like to contribute his locomotive to the uh, museum? And he did. It's now up there on a pedestal in Railroad Hall. Uh -oh. Tom, this is our old coach. You know, we were looking at it on the outside. Uh -huh. All the old original woodwork and the lamps should be polished, I suppose. Red plush seats. Are these, uh, uh, what, uh, kerosene? Yes, kerosene. That's all I had. The early lamps were candle and then kerosene, and they used gas. Mm -hmm. And up here is the old smoking compartment. It's hard to believe that you they mean had, way back then, but before Proposition 5, they had this, huh? Yes, from 1840 <laughs> on. So this is your your section of the car, okay. Tom. Let's sit down here and one a couple of the old seats. The original red plush, huh? Right. Don't you ever wonder who the people were that rode this coach from wherever to wherever and what they talked about and whether they were happy or unhappy? Or Sometimes I come out here on a quiet day and just sit and imagine all the different... Uh, passengers, yeah. what they would be doing, and uh, the little kids are running up and down the aisle. Choo-choo, Kimball. Choo-choo. And back to Disney. Alice in Wonderland was the next project for Kimball. This was another film that was difficult for most of the crew, but not for Ward. He was given juicy assignments, such as Tweedledee and Tweedledum, the March Hare, as well as a few scenes of the walrus and the carpenter and the understated Cheshire cat. <laughs> You may have noticed that I'm not all there myself. <laughs> and the more His most iconic character, however, is the Mad Hatter. Oh, what a delightful time! Is that thing cap? I'm so excited. We never get compliments. You must have a cup of tea. Arguably the best scene in the movie, and if you want to argue in the comments, go ahead and sound off. I mean, you're wrong, but sound off. Is the Mad Tea Party. Between Jerry Colonna and Edwin's voice work, and the Mary Blair-esque backgrounds, the dialogue, the animation, even the framing, makes it an incredibly enduring and entertaining sequence. Ward Kimball wasn't the only animator who worked on the scene, though. There were actually quite a lot, including Cliff Nordberg, Mark Davis, Wooly Reitherman, Marvin Woodward, John Lounsbury, among others. Ward animated the introduction of the Mad Hatter and the March Hare scolding Alice for being rude. The Mad Hatter pouring tea on himself, and our favorite, the Mad Hatter fixing the White Rabbit's watch. I really like the Mad Hatter's reaction to the March Hare when the March Hare's like, Hey, why don't you put some mustard in that? Mustard, yes, but mustard? Don't let's be silly. <laughs> The Hatter reacts with this great alarm, and he tilts his head and does this weird little shrug thing with his shoulders and hips. That, that was animated by Ward, and it's definitely a nice touch. Not to mention his follow-up response is just... <laughs> it's good. Lemon, that's different. That's Despite what it may look like, Kimball's not goofing around. He's really thinking about these characters, and he's, he's making a statement with a pencil. All of his characters in Alice are thoroughly conceived, believable, and the acting is the best of the best. What sequence in Disney history is more entertaining and iconic than the mad tea party scene? Its sculptural drawing, exaggerated gestures and actions, integration of voice with character, understanding of emotions, use of technique, and draftsmanship. It's just so good. It's, it's out of this world. Some idea. <laughs> uh, 
You were saying that you would like to think... Pardon me. Uh, you were seeking uh, some information of some kind? Again, though, I mean, sound off in the comments if you disagree. I mean, you know, feel free to get heated. Unfortunately, Alice in Wonderland was a flop. This was for many reasons. Author Leonard Maltin notes that Ward Kimball felt the film failed because, and I quote, it suffered from too many cooks, directors. Here was a case of five directors each trying to top the other guy and make his sequence the biggest and craziest in the show. This had a self-canceling effect on the final product, unquote. Walt seems to have agreed, himself stating that the film wasn't great because there was no warmth in Alice's character. Man, if they thought this film was a flop, I'd hate to hear what they say about Mars Needs Moms. Like, you want to talk about some bad Disney flops? Oh, man. Like, I think even Home on the Range made some money back. Mars Needs Moms, I don't think that even made half its money back. Up next came Peter Pan, where Kimball had a bit of a hard time finding his place. He was by this point one of the few animators in the studio who never went to Milt Call for drawing advice, and therefore didn't acknowledge his influence on the Disney style. The animation was becoming less imaginative and straighter, making it harder for the man with the wild imagination to express himself. Kimball, by this film, was also rather bored with animation and wanted to find a new challenge. So on Pan, he mainly focused on minor characters, such as the Indian Chief and some of the Lost Boys. While struggling to find his niche in the current environment in feature animation, Ward Kimball looked for other outlets for his creativity, and his first attempts were directing and animating in two groundbreaking musical shorts, Melody and Toot, Whistle, Pluck, and Boom. Both were huge successes and were the first Disney films ever to use limited animation. In 1954, the animator moved out of feature animation altogether and moved upstairs to work on the Space series for the Disneyland TV show. I was so relieved to get away from animation. I knew how to do it. I wanted to have some say about the content. And that's exactly what he found because in the Space series, he embraced a creative freedom very few artists have ever had in the animation industry. Those were the happiest moments of my life. Uh, uh, I did the space pictures with Willie Lay and Von Braun because they were the they came over from Germany after the war was over. And uh, were our speakers. The payload in the top section will consist of ten crew members plus equipment. I introduced the first one. That was man in space, what happens to you if you didn't wear a space suit? And you freeze on one side, you melt on the other. He would soon broil on the one side and freeze on the other. When uh, President Eisenhower saw man in space, he realized that none of his generals in the Pentagon knew what it was all about. And would you believe he asked Walt if he could borrow a print of that picture to run for the brass in the Pentagon. He flew them all in for a couple of weeks and ran this every day. And I always got a kick out of that. And then, then Mars and beyond. Mars is very populated with luminous birds who do not fly. Ward was a great animator and an interesting individual. Sure, a lot of people like trains and collect them, but how many can boast an entire collection of real trains? Just him. Not only that, but he persevered through the Great Depression in order to make his dreams come true. Now, thanks to him, we're able to come face to face with fascinating characters that he helped bring to life. In the words of the Mad Hatter, Two days slow, that's what it is. In the last two installments, we talked a lot about Ward's life. He was born on March 4, 1914 in Minneapolis and went to school at Santa Barbara School of the Arts in order to become a painter and illustrator. Instead, he got a job at Disney for the money and stayed for the innovative work the company was doing. Ward was well known for his practical jokes. There was one gag that I, I went down the Salvation Army and I, I collected a lot of old shoes. You could buy them then for 50 cents a pair. And I bought secondhand trousers. And I, I got the studio very early one morning after I'd been bringing the shoes in one pair at a time and stashing them in my room. I went into all the men's cans. I, I had, had made these little U-shaped wooden <laughs> braces and I put it in the shoes and let the pants sort of wrinkle down below. So if you looked underneath, it looked like the, the stall was occupied. And now I'd climb up over the top of the, the door and leave it there. Well, 
Sometime around 10 o'clock, uh, the accumulation of the male population in the studio on <laughs> having to use the Johns had sort of reached a uh, explosion point because they'd go in and beat on, hey, hurry up in there, what's going on? And they'd look down underneath to make sure, and they'd see the <laughs> shoes in the ring. And that went on till about 2 in the afternoon. Ward worked on a deleted soup scene for Snow White and subsequently moved on to Jiminy Cricket in Pinocchio. You can learn more about that right here. Oops, I mean, here. For Fantasia, Ward, along with Walt Kelly, was given Bacchus and Jockus, the drunken god and his donkey, in the pastoral symphony segment. Ward also helped with the many centaurs in the film. We'd never done centaurs before. Half human, half horse. The guys were big, robust, macho centaurs. But the girls... Uh, what do you do when you have a, a, a young girl the front end and a horse on the rear? How do you handle the anatomy? And uh, what do you show and what don't you show? I have a whole stack of memos about how things should be drawn and long shots and close-ups and so forth. That's pretty hu uh, humorous in itself. Ward states in an interview with Jim Corcus, my favorite scene in Fantasia is the dance of the hours, with the hippo and the alligator. I wish I had worked on that. Instead, I got stuck on the pastoral symphony, with Bacchus chasing the centaurettes. I hated those candy box colors in that scene. Oh, I just remembered. I also like the night on Bald Mountain. Artistically, it was probably our greatest effort. And at the same time it came out, it was a bomb. Walt felt pretty bad about it. He thought he was going to bring a little culture to the American people and the world. It did get rediscovered later. Kids ask me if we were on some drugs when we made that picture. And I say no, we were just trained that way. We thought that way. The strongest drug we had was an occasional martini. Disney's next film was a unique one. The Reluctant Dragon was essentially a tour of the then-new Walt Disney Studios facility in Burbank, California. The film stars radio comedian Robert Benchley and many Disney staffers, such as Fred Moore, Norman Ferguson, Clarence Nash, Walt Disney, and Ward Kimball, all as themselves. Pretty soft for you just making funny pictures all day. You think so? Well, the first hundred thousand are the hardest. I know who it is now. Goofy. Only three fingers? Yeah, saves time and looks better. <laughs> Don't forget that other button. <laughs> no shoes? Boy, what size are those? Oh, about uh, 15 and a half. <laughs> there you are. Now let's see how the whole scene looks. Ready? Okay, shoot. Ward also animated the very title character himself, the Reluctant Dragon. I do not wish to discuss it further. I refuse to listen. I absolutely will not fight. Good night. You remember where they sent the reluctant dragon back, the whole thing to be ripped to ink and paint? I'd only be a minute. Yeah. Because the Hayes office wouldn't let let him put a belly button in the dragon. Do you remember that? Oh, yes. Oh, dear. Did that you guys know that? That's... Oh. oh, you love this. <laughs> the reluctant dragon was almost ready for release, and the Hayes office looked at it and said, you can't show the navel. They had to send the entire picture back. On a back. dragon, for dragon. sakes. Oh, oh, I'm bad. After work on Dumbo, for which he animated the crows, Ward animated some of Pedro in Saludos Amigos, which turned out to be one of the weakest assignments of his career. <sighs> However, the second film in the Latin American series, The Three Caballeros, turned out to be an absolute highlight in Ward's career. Woohoo! He animated the extremely entertaining and brilliantly choreographed scene, which I have not watched every day for a month, The Three Caballeros Song Sequence. No, really, I'd rewind and rewatch this film so often, I broke our VHS. We're three caballeros, three gay caballeros, they say we are birds of a feather. I was given this long song that went on for three, three and a half, four minutes, and no business. So I, I listened to the, the song for about a week. I turned all the lights out in the room. I just listen to the song and I visualize it and I said, there's nothing I can do except being literal about it. When they say, 
we're three happy chappies with, with snappy serapies. All of a sudden, the s- serapies appear. We're three happy chappies with snappy serapies. You find us beneath our sombreros. <laughs> We're brave and we'll stay so. We're bright as a peso. We say so, the three caballeros. One of the first criticisms when the director saw the pencil test is, well, the duck goes out to the right and he comes in on the left. And, and, and the rooster goes out at the top and he comes in from the bottom. You can't do that. It's not logical. You have to have these tie-ups. You have to make sense. And I said, look, who cares? Guy runs out on the left, comes in on, on the right. I mean, that, that gives it its flavor, its craziness. The whole thing is not only perfectly timed out, but it also features great actions and gestures to support the lyrics clearly. It's one of my favorite sequences, Ward says. The song was put in at the last minute because Walt felt there needed to be a song. I was given no direction, so I came up with the staging myself, making them do literally whatever they were singing. I went to one of the sound guys and had him extend the last note by 15 to 20 seconds. So I could do the bit where they try to dampen that last note. He gave the whole thing a real touch. Ward continued to shine in the years of World War II. First came Make Mine Music, where Kimball animated most of all the characters in the satirical but tragic The Whale Who Wanted to Sing at the Met. A whale who can sing? I don't believe it. as well as the cat. Duck. And Huntsman. In the Peter and the Wolf segment, the shot of the Huntsman walking is a textbook example of balance, pacing, and weight in action. Wait a minute, I'll show you. W-O-L-F. Wolf. Wolf! To the rescue! Then came Fun and Fancy Free, where the animator reprised his role of Jiminy Cricket, as well as animating Bongo and Lumpjaw, the villainous black bear in the Bongo segment. Probably his best animation from this period, however, is in the third of the four package features, Melody Time. In it, Ward was the primary animator on the legendary cowboy, the toughest critter west of the Alamo, Pacos Bill. The cartoony style of the short and its broad but precise and witty sensibilities are in perfect balance. This is also one of the few times that Kimball had a successful collaboration with his rival, Milt Call. The two had very different opinions on animation, and their personalities clashed to the point where they were studio nemeses of sorts. Milt even bashed him frequently in interviews and said that his work, as well as that of Frank, Ollie, and Mark, was far superior to Ward's. However, in this segment, the two styles go together seamlessly, and there's a lot of great animation. Once there was a drought that spread all over Texas. So to sunny California, he did go. And though the gag is kinda corny, he brought rain from California. That's the way we got the Gulf of Mexico. So yippee yay yippee yay for the toughest critter west of the Alamo. They were both raised to a height that they never could have done alone, explained Ken Peterson. Milt broadened out his caricature and held Kimball down a little bit. Last came Ichabod Crane and Mr. Toad, where Kimball did Toad's escape and some of Ichabod and his horse in the nighttime ride sequence. From here, Ward began to lose his battle for the Disney style. You can hear all about it here. But essentially, Disney animation was becoming softer and rounder, instead of cartoony and abstractist. Sort of a 
Disney puberty, if you will. Ward eventually found new life in directing shorts like Toot, Whistle, Pluck, and Boom, and The Man in Space series. In 1955, Walt Disney announced that he would produce Babes in Toyland as an animated feature, for which he assigned Ward to direct. Walt was stubborn, Ward says. Once he got something in his head, that was it. I remember one time when he got really mad at me. I was working on the script for Babes in Toyland because if the picture was not put into production soon, the studio would lose the rights to do the story. So while Walt was over in Europe, somebody in the publicity department, to guarantee that the other studios knew Disney was doing the film, put a full-page ad in the trades that read, Congratulations to Ward Kimball as he starts direction on Disney's Babes in Toyland. Well, Walt had wanted me to direct, but when he got back from Europe and saw the notice, he thought I was pushing myself. So he removed me from the picture. I went in and pointed out that it was the publicity department that had done it, and I even named the names of the guys involved. But Walt was stubborn, and that was it. This was not the only fight that Walt and Ward got into. One time, Walt and I got into a big fight over politics, Ward says. Walt wanted the staff to donate money to the Nixon campaign, and I vehemently refused. Walt didn't like that, and in fact, did not call me back to his bedside when he was dying, where he supposedly gave directions to his underlings about how he wanted things to go after his death. I was in Paris and was getting ready to leave the next morning when I got a phone call telling me Walt was dead. Even though I expected it would happen, I was so stunned that I lay awake in my bed, stiff as a board with my mind racing about what would happen at the Disney Studios. Although he constantly tried to experiment for the rest of his career, more and more Kimball didn't feel welcomed in the creative environment at the studio. And the management did more and more to try to control him. This led to him taking an extended vacation in 1972 and officially retiring on August 31st, 1973. However, over the years, the retired Ward and the studio grew closer again, and he was always very encouraging to the young animators at the studio, just like the kind of grandfatherly figure the studio needed. He also worked in retirement on a lot of personal artwork. After working with animation and movement and all the intricate forms of, of movement, I decided that doing static paintings left a lot to be desired. So I started doing what I call constructions or kinetics, and one of the first ones I did was this thing I call the trolley car. Now this one, you start the action going by giving it a shake, and then you get the movement of the people in the window. I think my next uh, construction was one I call watermelon. And uh, here we come to a door that says closed door went through, and people opened the door and saw the beetle, they immediately realized that what appeared to be watermelon seeds were actually June bugs. This is a large seven-foot painting I did of a, I called it Sick Cadillac. This was actually based on an experience I had when I saw a brand new pink Cadillac going down Melrose Avenue, still had its paper license plate, but had been in a terrible wreck. The whole rear end was chewed up. So I decided to paint it like human flesh. And the original car was still able to make a left turn with the indicators. Here's a portrait I painted of my son-in-law. It's a four-sided cube. It keeps turning so you can stop it or enjoy all four views, unlike a static one-view-only portrait. Another thing I discovered down here in the Kimmel catacombs the other day was some old paintings I had done in the 30s and 40s. The first one... <laughs> It shows Betty, my wife, when she was pregnant. I thought it was so interesting, I made a complete painting of all different views from the sketches I had made. Now, I have one more to show you here. My greatest achievement. I did this when I had the mumps. If you never had the mumps when you were in your 40s, you haven't really had it. I was sick, 106 degrees temperature, but I got out my paints and I bought 15 minutes, I scumbled in exactly what I saw in the mirror. He was also well known for his very creative Christmas cards. Ward passed away on July 8, 2002, at the age of 88 in Los Angeles, California. Ward is probably one of our favorite Disney animators. His rebellious nature coupled with his unique and modern art style makes him stand out among the other more traditional animators. Style-wise, Ward Kimball was a caricaturist and had a brilliant, endless imagination. He always tried to find the most entertaining way to do a scene and searched and searched till he found the perfect layout. 
Kimball valued innovation and encouraged people to really try different things. He never repeated himself, and once he felt he mastered something, he always went on to break a new boundary rather than to try and live up to his past best work. He also proved that broad satirical animation can be sincere, meaningful, and precise. This opened up a whole new door for possible Disney characters and really changed the way things were done. Who could possibly imagine where animation would have been without Ward Kimball? We certainly can't. And quite frankly, it's, it's scary to try. Thank you to these people for your generous support. And a special thank you to John David. You guys are really helping keep this channel afloat. Thank you. Thank you for watching this episode of Dizographies. Don't forget to check out our Patreon and Discord, and click the thumbs up button below if you liked the video. And if you want to be notified when the next episode comes out, subscribe and click the bell. Comment below with characters you would like to see us cover. Further reading and references are linked below. We hope to see you in another Dizography.